God bless you today. Uh, when the service is over, as you're exiting, you can get the notes of the, the message if you don't want to get hands cramped as you're trying to write down all the scriptures. So those are available uh, afterwards. Well, uh, today we're going to start a little mini-series, only, uh, only three messages long. Uh, this past week, many of you know this was a very special week for me, very uh, meaningful week for me. It's kind of a tradition for me because it was April Fool's this, this past week. And in our family, we have a tradition of, of I try to do an April Fool's on everybody. And, and I even get texts from out of state or phone calls now from out of state, people trying to April Fool's me because over the years, it's just been kind of a tradition with certain people that we try to April Fool each other. And, and even the day before April Fool's, my daughter Rebecca said to her husband, I got to be careful tomorrow. Dad's going to try and April fool me, so I got to be ready. Guess what? I got her anyway. Even though she knew it was coming, I still got her. It, it's just something we do in our family. We like doing April fools. Well, I was thinking, how am I going to get Matthew this year? Well, Matthew, I said to him a few weeks ago, uh, he's going to Canada for a conference. And I said, well, you know, remember, in order to get into Canada now, you must have a passport. And so uh, he remembered that, and, and I said, is, is your passport still valid? Well, he checked. No, it wasn't. It had expired, by the way. Don't let your passports expire. Keep them current. And so I said, well, you must, you must take care of that. If you're going to, to Canada, you've got to have your passport. So he told me that, that, that Tuesday he was going up to Thousand Palms. I said, go to the post office in Thousand Palms, because you don't need an appointment. You can just walk in and fill out the papers do it all right there. It doesn't take long. You have the money ahead of time, uh, just, and, and, and you're done with it. Well, so I thought, okay, it's April Fool's. I can get him on this one. So I sent him a text. And by the way, texting has revolutionized April fooling, if you, if you know that. And so I text him, and I said, uh, don't bother going to the post office today. Uh, I heard it on Fox News. There was a breach of security at the NSA. Uh, and because of that, they're not doing any passport renewals until they get it all worked out. Well, no, hey, that sounds kind of half believable, doesn't it? So I thought, this is a good one. And I knew he was going to be picking up Mark Edwards, so I, Mark Edwards hadn't left yet, so I sent him the text. And I'm, I'm waiting because I drafted the other text that we simply said, April Fool's, exclamation points, you know, I got you. And I'm ready to click that as soon as I get his response. Well, he doesn't respond. And so I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I'm thinking, well, I'm, what, what is it? He's not checking his text. So I text him again and I said, did you get my text? Well, he texted me back. He said, I'm in Thousand Palms now. And that's all I said. So I quick hit the one that I drafted, April Fool's. You know, I thought, I got him, April Fool's. And I didn't hear back for two or three hours. And I thought, what's going on? And then I get a text back from him. He says, well, I got your April Fool's text, but I had already driven all the way home from Thousand Palms, and my schedule's too filled. I can't go back up there. I don't know when I'm going to do it. And I thought, I know what he's doing. He's trying to a reverse April Fool me. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to make me feel bad that I wasted his day. This is a reverse April Fool's, and I'm not falling for it. Nobody gets me on April Fool's. Well, come to find out, it wasn't a reverse April Fool's. He was at a gas station right next to the post office when he got my text, and he got back in his vehicle, and since you can't text and drive, and you can't phone and drive, he didn't check his text until he got all the way home, and he was telling me the truth, and I felt so bad I wasted his whole day. But his schedule was such, he didn't know when he could get, but now he's got to rearrange his schedule to get back, get back up there, so, and I apologize, I'm sorry, I felt, then I felt really bad, you know. Not bad enough that I won't do it again next year, but I did feel bad. And so, so then he goes, he, go, he drives all the way up there the next day, and he waits in line, it's his turn, and they say, well, you must have an appointment. Well, I didn't think you needed an appointment at this post office. Well, now you do, you must have an appointment. Well, can I make an appointment? No, you have to call to get an appointment. <laughs> You know, you get frustrated. I'm standing right here. Why can't I make an appointment? No, you got to call to make an appointment. So he drives all the way home. He calls. Guess what? They're closed. He can't make an appointment. He just gets this machine. You, you know, you, know, you got to call back in the next day after a certain time. So now he's wasted two days trying to get this. Twice he's trying to get this done. And, and so then he's, he thinks to himself, well, I'm going to go local. I, I, I don't have an appointment anyway. I'll just take the pay. They gave him papers at the first place. 
So I'm going to fill out these papers. I'm just going to go to a local uh, post office. Why drive all the way up there? Well, guess what? You must have passport photos. He didn't have them. So now he's got to go to AAA and get passport photos. So now he's got his passport photos. He's got his forms filled out. He's got his money. He goes back now for the fourth time to a post office, and, they, and he waits his turn in line. It gets to be his turn, and they say, well, you must have the new forms. You can't use these forms. But I just got them from the other post office. Yeah, but we got new forms now. You have to use those. Well, do you have some of those? No, you got to get them off online. <laughs> you must use the new forms. So he's got to leave again, all because of my April Fool's joke. I better be ready next year. And so, so he's got to leave again. So he goes home. He gets on the computer, the address they gave him. He prints out the forms, the new forms. Guess what? They're identical to the forms he's already filled out. Four different trips to the post office, four different instructions. Finally, finally he gets it done. Have you had that kind of experience? You waited in line only to find out, maybe not at the post. How about the, how many of you like going to the De Department of Motor Vehicles? There's one. There's, there's a joy ride for you. You go to the Department of Motor Vehicles. I, I, I did this in another state, not here. I, went, I waited for an hour, and it was finally my turn. And they said, well, no, you got the wrong form. You fill out the wrong form. Well, can I have the right form? Yeah, sure, they're right over there. Just go get it, fill it out, get back in line. Back in line? I just waited an hour, so I do it again. I wait another hour. I give her the form. And she said, well, you didn't fill it out right. You've got to have such and such a card with you. Well, there goes another day. Don't, aren't you frustrated when you've got to? You wait and you wait and you hope and you think you got it all together, and then you find out there's another must that you didn't have done. That word must can be a nasty word. That word must can be a... A hard word. Do you know Jesus used the word must many times? And most of the time when Jesus used the word must, he used it about himself. Most of the time when Jesus used the word must, almost every time he used the word must, it was about himself. Now what is the word must? It's just a simple little word uh, in the Greek. In, in, in English there's just three letters, D-E-I, and it's pronounced dia. And it comes from another word, D-O. But the word D-O that it comes from means to be bound. Think of that now. What is the word must? It means something that is binding on you. It means something you're not going to get out of. It's something that is an absolute necessity. It is an absolute requirement. It's binding on you. That word D-O is used, for example, in the scripture where it talks about uh, the woman who was bound these 18 years by Satan. That's that word, bound. So when Jesus uses the word must, he's saying th th there are certain activities that are binding upon you and you can't get out of them. They're, they're must. They're a must. Well, look at a couple of times where he used this, this word must about himself. In Luke, there's several times he says, Luke 2, 49, I must be about my father's business. Luke 4.43, I must preach the kingdom of God in other villages also. Luke 9.22, the Son of Man must first suffer many things. Luke 24.7, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of, of scribes and, and Pharisees. John 3.14, the Son of Man must be lifted up. John 9.4, I must work the, work the works of him that, that sent me. In, in, in 10, he said, I must bring the others in also. So Jesus had, most of the time when Jesus used the word must, he was talking about his own suffering. He was talking about how he must go to Jerusalem, how he must be rejected by the scribes, how he must be delivered up, how he must die. In other words, Jesus said, there is something on my life that's binding. There's a must on my life. That word must is a really, really important word when it comes from the lips of God, when God says there's something that must be done. Now, I want to talk to you in this little mini-series about, about the musts of Jesus. And what I want to look at is not just what he said must happen to him and what he must do, but there are at least three times where Jesus said, there's something you must do. And I want to remind you, the power of this word is not just in the word must, it's in the one who's saying it. Jesus is saying. There are at least three things that you and I if we're to be his followers, that we must do. There's at least three things that are binding on us that we must do. 
We're not talking about some religion saying it or a government saying it, as important as those things are. And, and I love, I love this, this whole idea because Jesus, everybody you talk to is going to acknowledge that Jesus knows about God. Jesus knows about spiritual things. Jesus knows about eternity. And so if there's something that Jesus says must about, we better pay attention. There's three of them. We're only going to take one today. And, and please, after the service, don't come up to me and say, hey, pastor, what are the other two? No, you must come back to get the other two. That's, that's, that's a must. I'm not going to tell you the other two today. And the first one you've probably already guessed. It's in John chapter 3. You must be born again. Turn there. John chapter 3, a conversation with Nicodemus. You must be born again. And Jesus used this word, this word which means you, you are bound by this. There's no, there's no, there's no uh, options. There's no loopholes. It's not like, well, it's good if you're born again. It's nice if you're born again. It's okay if you're born again and they're not. No, you must be born again. And this one word should shape our living. That we must be born again, but, but then we, we also have an obligation if it's a must. For the people we love, the people we care about. For them to know that they must be born again. I'm going to read you the first 21 verses of John 3. It's Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. And just by way of context, let me remind you that Nicodemus is, uh, and at the time uh, that this happened, in, in, among his peers, he was a very respected man. If you want to look at human goodness, what does it mean to be good? Well, in terms of human goodness, Nicodemus would be at the top of the list. He's respected by his peers. He seems to be a man of real quality. He seems to be a man of real integrity. There's a, a few passages about Nicodemus. We can sketch some things together about him. But we're not talking about some drunkard or some bum in the street. We're not talking about someone who's openly violent in his life or terribly immoral in his life. No, he's a good religious man. And Jesus said, you must be born again. It's a must. It's one of the musts of Jesus. Well, here we see this conversation. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi... We know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel, and you don't know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. So Jesus, this is his first must. Here's what he says. Nicodemus, you must 
Don't be surprised that I'm saying this to you. You must be born again. He's saying, Nicodemus, you're not an exception. There's a must on your life. You're good, you're religious, you're upright, you're respected, but there is a must here. You must be born again. Nicodemus doesn't get it, and I'm glad in a way he didn't get it because it leads to this conversation. And we can get great insight from, from what Jesus answered him. But let's define what we're talking about. What do we mean by born again anyway? Nicodemus wondered that. What, what are you talking about, Jesus, born again? Do you have to go back to your mother's womb once you're old? What do you mean, born again? Well, the first word of that phrase is easy, born. It means to have received life. It means to have been begotten. It means to have been generated. That's easy to understand. You were born. In other words, you received life from other people. And you were born. You were conceived and you grew in the womb and then you were born. That's, that's all it means. You're born. And so Jesus said, you've got to have another experience like that. You've got to be born again. Now, the second word in the phrase is really interesting. It's the Greek word anothen. Anothen. You can write that down. Anothen. And here's what anothen means. I found this really fascinating. It means that which is from the beginning. That which is first. First meaning from the beginning. It can mean a new creation or something that is newly created, brand new. But the, the, the first meaning or rendering of this word, anothen, is that which is from the beginning. Well, how can we be born from the beginning? Our parents weren't here in the beginning. Well, you're going to see this is another way of saying you must be born of God. Because only God was here from the beginning. Only God was in existence before there was anything else. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And even in John's uh, lead into both his epistles and, and the gospel, he talks about that which is from the beginning. And so we're talking about a, a mysterious kind of birth. This word, again, it's word anothen in chapter 3 here of John, verse 3 and verse 7. It's translated again. Or a second time, you must be born again. But literally, you must be born anothen. You must have life that comes from the beginning. Well, how can you have life that comes from the beginning? Here's the answer. You've got to be born of the one who was from the beginning, God. Now, this word anothen also means uh, from above. It can be translated from above. It's not, I shouldn't have said it means. It, it's just translated from above. And there's a reason for that. I'll show you that in a moment, but there's a couple times where it's, it's translated uh, from above. John 3, 31, it's translated from above. In, in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 17, where he talks about good, perfect gift, they come from above. Chapter 3 of James, wisdom that comes from above. He's talking about God's wisdom. He's talking about that which comes from God. That, those gifts that God bestows, they come from God. That wisdom that is God's wisdom, not earthly wisdom, it comes from God. So now we see how this word is used. A note that it means of God, from God. You must have a birth that is from God. You must be born again. Here's another really fascinating use of this word, a note. And I was just interested by the picture of this. Remember in, in the, the story of Jesus' per, uh, uh, crucifixion, the earth shook, the, it turned dark, and, and the earth shook, and the graves opened. I mean, just really incredible, phenomenal stuff happening when he died on the cross, but it says the veil was ripped, and your translation literally says from top to bottom, right? And the reason it says from top to bottom, we get the impression, wait, a man didn't rip that. And I've even said that myself. Well, from top to bottom, uh, a man didn't rip it. Well, you know what? I was wrong. Because that, that curtain was hung by a man at one point in history. Somebody had some scaffoldings to get up there. So it could have, been, but no, the word is anothen, and literally what he's saying is the veil was ripped from above. The veil was, that's, that's a, a way of saying the veil was ripped by God. The veil was ripped from above. Yeah, top to bottom, we get the picture, but the anothen. It, the, and notice this, now maybe I'm stretching this too much, but I got to thinking and chewing on this. The veil was ripped from anothen. Could that also mean the veil was ripped from the very beginning? In other words, in the heart of God, He always wanted to open up His presence to whoever would come. 
And Jesus was always the Lamb that was slain from before the foundation of the world, from the beginning. And so when Jesus used this word, uh, keep this in mind, Nicodemus is approaching Jesus, and he's approaching Jesus as if Jesus is a rabbi. Now that's significant, because at the time of Jesus, rabbis and other religious leaders, and many in Judaism still do this today, they will not directly refer to God. They will not say the word God. So if you want to talk about someone without using their name, how do you do that? You come up with other pictures that people get the message. And here's what they would do. They would talk about uh, heaven. For example, in Matthew, very Jewish document, Matthew. Oftentimes instead of saying kingdom of God, it'll say kingdom of heaven. Same thing. It's just another way of saying God without saying the word God. Or they would say angels, like in the parable of prodigal son. He said the angels of heaven, and heaven was rejoicing. Well, who was really rejoicing? God was rejoicing. I don't doubt but what the angels got happy too, but they didn't really understand what was going on. That's a rabbi's way of saying God. So literally, born again from all these different angles, it's very clear to see what Jesus is saying. To be born again or to be born from above is a simple way of saying you must be born from God. You must have life that came from God. You've got to be born a second time. And, and you must receive this life from God. John 1, 12 and 13. A very insightful passage. He says he came unto his own. His own did not receive him not. But then it says he came as many as received him. To them he gave the right to become the children of God. They're born. Then he uses the word born. They're born not of the will of man. They're born not of the flesh of uh, blood. But they are born of God. This is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, Nicodemus... Don't you marvel at this. Don't you be surprised at this. Even though you're a religious man, even though you're a respected man, even though you're a good, decent man, you have a must on your life. You must be born again. I want to take a jump into our time just for a moment. Hey, if Nicodemus needed to be born again, you and I don't know anybody that doesn't need to be born again. Nicodemus is at the top of the class in terms of human goodness and, and, and integrity and respectability. He needed to be born again. It was a must on his life. You must be born again. There, this is a binding thing. You must be born again. And, and if you're born from above, it means to be born of God. And, and, and John emphasizes this in his writings, not only in the Gospel of John, but in, in 1 John chapter 2, he says, if you're born of God, that, those are the ones that really have righteousness. John chapter 3, 1 John rather, chapter 3, if you're born of God, you don't continue in a lifestyle of sin because the seed of God is within you. 1 John 5, if you believe you're born of God, you overcome the world. And so John, more than any other writer, really gets a grip on what it means to be born of God. 1 John 5, 18, you're born of God. The whole world lies in wickedness, but you're born of God. In other words, they received their life from this world, but you've received life from somewhere else. From above, from God. You're born of God. And so Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, you, you must be born of God. And, and there's other verses in the Bible that, that parallel this. Titus 3, 5. Not, not our works of righteousness, it's His mercy. But He says, and the regenerating of the Holy Spirit. And that word regenerating is the word born. Born again. To have another birth. And, and, and look at 2 Corinthians 5.17. I, I love to quote 5.17. 2 Corinthians, if any man be in Christ, he is what? You know the verse. A new creation. What does the word anothen mean? That which is brand new. That which is from the beginning. You could say it this way. That which is from eternity. And so literally, you could, you could, you, I don't think it's a violation to say, if any man is in Christ, he's been born again. He's a new creation. He has received life that is from the beginning, from above, anothen, born again. You must be born again. Now, Nicodemus doesn't understand this. Nicodemus is thinking about human birth. And, and so Nicodemus said, what do you mean? I mean, once a man is grown up, 
you, you're talking about going back into the mother's womb, and Jesus said, no, Nicodemus, you, not only do you need to be born of water, see there, that where he says water, that's referring to natural birth. What happens right before the baby's born? Water breaks. You're born of water. That was a phrase in those days of just normal human birth. And so he said, no, no, and Nicodemus is talking about the womb and going back to the womb. It's in that context. And Jesus said, no, no, that's not what I'm talking about. Not only do you need to be born of water, now he defines it even more. You need to be born of the Spirit. It's the Spirit of God that gives you life. This is what you need. Now, now there's mystery here. And, and I want to be very careful to, to try, at least, to never say what God hasn't said and, and to try and figure out what God hasn't revealed. And, and nowhere is this more uh, pertinent in, than in this whole idea of what happens in a human being when they are born again. Well, we know a lot about it because we've experienced it, and we know about it because we read about it in the Bible. But no matter how much we know about it, there's always going to be a sense of mystery. And didn't Jesus include that idea of mystery? Because Nicodemus, I, I love the honesty here, the honest exchange. Jesus was basically saying, Nicodemus, you must be born again. But there are aspects of this born again that you'll never understand. No one will. It's mystery. It's like the wind. It's like the wind. And he said, you, you, you don't know where it's going. You don't know where it's come from. But you feel its effects. And if we took a survey of everyone in this room or everyone that hears this message that has been born again and we wrote down the details of how each one of us came to be born again, there would be common elements in each one, but everyone would also be very different, wouldn't it? How you came to be born again is different than how I came to be born again. Yes, common elements. We'll look at that at the end of our message today. But there's always this sense of mystery. It's, it's not a formula that you put in a religious box and say, do steps one, two, three, push the button, now you're born again. No, there's this sense of the mystery of God. And by the way, how can we believe in God and not believe in mystery? Who can figure out God? And yet when we experience there's something deep within us that even though we can't understand, we know. That seems like a contradiction, but we can't understand, yet we know why it's mystery. And we don't know what, what, where the wind came from. We don't know where the wind is going, but we feel its effects. And Jesus said, so is it with everyone that's born again. There's an element of mystery in this, but here's the bottom line. Have you been born again? Maybe you were born again kneeling at an altar in a church. Maybe, like me, you were in a, in a car on a rainy day. Or maybe you were like my wife standing as a 13-year-old girl in front of her locker at school. I mean, there's all different times, places, ways, but were you born again? Because you must be born again. It's like the wind. Yeah, and there are people, I took a course in meteorology, and I know the formula, you know, temperature differences create pressure differences, and pressure differences create drive wind. I can say that until I'm blue in the face, but I don't understand wind. And you know what? You don't either. Not really. We understand some of the dynamics if you've looked at it a little bit, but basically wind. And the ancients called wind uh, the breath of God. See, because they couldn't see God. But when they felt wind, they would say, that's the breath of God. And the Hebrew word for wind is the same word as spirit and is the same word as, as breath. It's the word ruach. And the Greek word pneuma, it's the same word as spirit, wind, and breath. All are the same words, both in Hebrew, ruach, and pneuma in Greek. And it means, it means spirit, it means wind, or it means breath. And Jesus was literally saying, you've got to be born of God. Now, put, your, put yourself in the mindset of Nicodemus. What is spirit to him? It's the breath of God. It's the wind of God. And now Jesus is talking about spirit, and Jesus is talking about wind it's like the wind, Nicodemus. You don't know where it's going. You don't know where it came from, but you feel it. And there, there must always be this sense of, of mystery. And, and when we remove that sense of mystery, we've, we've somehow diluted something from the Bible. Somehow we want to make salvation this formula that we can put in a, in a neat little package. And, okay, you do this, you do this, you do this, and now you're saved. I don't think it works that way. There are common elements, common ingredients, but... There must be something of the Spirit involved. And when the Spirit is involved, there's always mystery. But the bottom line is simply this. You must, you must be born 
Again, it's the Spirit that gives us life, and, and the life that the Spirit gives us is eternal life, and, and this, this, this eternal life that the Spirit gives us is the very nature of God within us. I mean, who can understand this? Who can understand that you, who have a beginning in time, can now have a birth that is from the beginning? Not your beginning, but the beginning of existence before that. Eternity, eternal life. I mean, we don't understand these things, but we can embrace them. We, 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 can, we can experience them. We can, in that sense, we can know them. They're like the wind. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, don't, don't, be cons- don't be surprised that even you have to be born again. Now, write these three things down. I want to give you three reasons, and we won't belabor each one, but three simple reasons in the conversation of Jesus. That three reasons why you must be born again. To be honest with you, we really don't need these reasons. It's kind of like a little child and a parent. The parent says, shut the door. The child says, why? What does the parent sometimes say? Because I said so. Well, when it's God, that's really all we need, (laughs) because I said so. I mean, who are we to argue with Jesus? If Jesus said, you must be born again, he doesn't have to give us any reasons. That should be enough, but he does give us some reasons. And here's reason number one. Look at verse 6. Why must you be born again? Why is it a must? Because he said, that which is flesh is flesh. That which is flesh is flesh. I want you to write down this next phrase. It shows the love of God and the goodness of God. The reason that you must be born again is because that which is flesh is flesh, and God created you to be much more than flesh. God created you to be much more than flesh. You're more than biological life. You're more than cells exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide. You're more than the beating of a heart. And and you're more than, than some kind of electrical impulses in your brain. You're more than all that. Flesh is that. The animal kingdom is that. But you were created by God to be more than flesh. And isn't this the, the intellectual battleground of our day? Why? Because they don't want you to believe in a creator. They want you to believe that you just somehow evolved through, I don't know, millions of random mutations over millions or billions of years, and you just became what you are? That's a leap of faith. But why, why is that a battleground? Because, because God created you to be more than flesh. Well, that is true. What did he create us to be? What is more than flesh? How about the image of God? God created man. He said, let us make man in our image. You were created to reflect God. Let us create man in our image. And then he said, and and, and give him dominion over all the works of my creation. That's what you were created for. You were created to be more than flesh. But here's the most amazing mystery of all. You were created to know God. You were created to be able to know God. Genesis 3.8, God came and walked with Adam in the cool of the day. I can't even imagine what that was like. Incredible. God himself taking a walk with Adam. They knew each other. Wow. That's what you were created for. Now here, here's, it almost sounds heretical what I'm about to say. You were created to contain God. Now, but when I say contain, I don't mean that in a limiting sense, but you are created to be able to have God inside of you. How do we possibly even begin to understand that? That's mystery. What God made man from the dust of the ground, Genesis 2, and what did God do? He breathed, as that word ruach, breath, spirit, wind. God breathed into him, and Adam became more than flesh. He became a living soul, and as a living soul, he could reflect God. As a living soul, he could contain God, not restrain, but have God 
He's spirit. God is spirit. They're relating. This is phenomenal. I can't even describe it. But if you've been born again, you've experienced it. What happened when you were born again? Romans 8 and Galatians 4. What happened when you were born again? The Spirit of God came into your life. So where did He come? I, I don't know. It's mystery. We use the term heart. Is He in the ventricles? In the, I, mean, no, I mean, somehow He came into that inner, that spirit man that came alive, and now my spirit is united with His spirit, and, and God thinks something, and I feel it. Wow. God speaks to us. How does he speak to us? Not usually through words that we hear, but through that knowing. Because God created you to be more than flesh. But sin messed that all up. Something died when we sinned. The soul that sins, it will die, Ezekiel said. Wages of sin is death. So something has to be reborn. You must be born again, Nicodemus. Because you were created to be far more than flesh. You know, one of the things that would make us glorify God the most is if we truly got a glimpse of what he created us to be. Reflecting his glory, containing his presence. You were created to be more than flesh. And the reason you're not fulfilled is because you're living only as flesh. And the world wants us to think there's no morality, there's no ethics, there's no absolutes. Just live like an animal. You have an urge, go do it. That's the animal world. God created you to be much more than flesh. But how do we, how do we now experience that? Well, you must be born again. Transitioning into the second reason, and, and it is a sad, sad thing about the first reason. You're, that which is flesh is flesh, but here's the reality. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Flesh and blood, just mere humanness, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. I believe one of the saddest verses in the Bible, and I'm not telling you to go out and spend your $8.50 or whatever it costs to go to the movies. I know the popular movie now is Noah. Right, that's a popular movie now. Now, the, the, the similarities between Noah, the movie, and Noah in the Bible end with that one word, Noah. They got his name right, and there was a boat, and there was a flood, but not much else is accurate. But you know what I think one of, the, one, of the, one of the saddest verses in the whole Bible is about the story of Noah? It's Genesis 7, 16. It says, very simply, it just says, in some translations, and the door was shut. Other translation says, and the Lord shut him, meaning Noah. The Lord shut Noah in. The door was shut. What, what was it like for humanity when, they, when, when, the, when the waters started rising and they remembered that fool preacher? Remember that, 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 that idiot building that. What was that he was building? A what? And they remembered that guy and the water starts coming up. And did some of them get to the ark? Did some of them swim? How, what, were there people clawing on the sides? But they couldn't get in because the door was shut. And God shut that door. And someday the, the door of salvation will be forever shut. And this is the second reason you must be born again. Jesus said to Nicodemus, if you, unless you're born again, you cannot enter. Underline the word enter. You cannot enter the kingdom of God. He, Nicodemus, you're, even you, don't be surprised, even you, unless you're born again, verse 5, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. You've got to be born of, of, the, of the water. You've got to be born of the Spirit. Unless you do that, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. You're outside. You're not in, you're out. What does that mean? To be outside the kingdom of God. Well, in the days of Noah, what did it mean to be outside the ark? What did that mean? We use in the church, we use the term lost. It meant to be lost. It meant to be adhered. Look at what the words of John the Baptist. You can stay right in chapter 3. And now chapter 3 of John, verses 22 through the end, uh, not the words of Jesus, it's the words of John the Baptist. Because people came to John the Baptist and they said, hey, Jesus is baptizing more guys than you are. And John said, good, I must decrease, he has to increase. 
But, but look at the end of what he says here. If you're not in, then where are you? In verse 34, John 3, 4, He whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. If you're not in the kingdom of God, you're under the wrath of God. So you must be born again. And notice the words of Jesus. Let's flip back over to the words of Jesus, the red letters, beginning with verse 17. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So the second reason you must be born again is, if you're not born again, you're not in the kingdom. If you're not in the kingdom, where are you? You're under the wrath of God. You're already condemned. And here's another nasty word we don't like to use. Look at verse 16. You're perishing. You're perishing. And, and that, that word, perish, it's a, it's a word, apolumi. It means to be in the process of destruction. If, if you're not born again, then you are in the process of destruction. So there's no way you could ever find true fulfillment, no matter how great your family is or successful your business happens to be or how respected you are like Nicodemus. If you're not born again, you're not in the kingdom, which means you're under wrath, you're condemned, you're perishing. And Oh, people get offended when you tell them that, but it is what it is. Nicodemus, don't be surprised I'm telling you this stuff. See, this is a conversation Jesus had with religious Nicodemus. And I hope you get to have this conversation with somebody very soon. And they might be offended. But it doesn't change the word must. You must, must be born again. And here's the last reason, the third reason. Jesus said, unless you're born again, you're never going to see the kingdom. You're never going to see the kingdom. And the word see is idon, A-I-D-E-N, but it's pronounced idon. And basically what idon means, it has to do with perception. There are different words for sight that's more than just the optical thing with light and all that. It, it, this one has, it has to do with perceiving as well as seeing. When he said, unless you're born again, you will not see the kingdom of God, what he meant by that was, unless you're born again, you'll never understand the life of the kingdom. You'll never get it. Notice who he's talking to, Nicodemus. And Nicodemus does not get it, does he? What are you talking about, Jesus? Can you go back in your mother's womb? You just don't get it, Nicodemus, unless you're born again. And notice how Jesus talks to him. He's not just putting him down. He's saying, Nicodemus, you're a teacher in Israel, and you don't get these things. He's sharing with Nicodemus. He is illustrating his point that unless you're born again, you won't understand the kingdom of God. Nicodemus didn't understand the kingdom of God because he wasn't yet born again. What is the kingdom of God? It's not meat or drink, Romans chapter 14, verse 17. It's, it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. See, unless you're born again, uh, you, you don't have the righteousness required to get into the kingdom of God. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 20, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, in no way are you entering in. And he put the emphasis there. In no way are you entering in. So there has to be a righteousness that is greater than what we find in religion. And there has to be a joy that is greater than what we experience through circumstances. And there has to be a peace that is greater than just having a calmness in your activities. It's the kingdom of God. There's, there's a life that is foreign to a human being until they're born again. It's the life of the kingdom. And until someone is born again, you can look at somebody who is born again, and, and you will not understand their righteousness. You just won't get it. You won't understand it. They'll have a joy in their suffering that, that you, just, you just won't understand. Uh, I saw your wife at the hospital, and she shared a testimony. She said a lot of us like to go out to eat after church. That's a good idea. Isn't it? That's a good thing. It's a good tradition. It's a good religious habit to be in. Get together with some friends, go out to eat. And she said, the waitress said to me one day, why are you people so happy? I love that when she labeled Christians, you people. Why are you people so happy? 
See, what she was perceiving was, these people have a joy that I don't have, and I don't understand it, but I want to. See, unless you're born again, you're never going to see the kingdom of God. Rose was able to share about Jesus, and I, I hope you have experiences like that this week where somebody notices a joy about you that they don't understand or a peace about you that they don't understand. And if you're listening to this message and you're, you're identifying, well, yeah, I, I know this person, and they say they're born again, and they've got something. I just don't know what it is. I don't know how to get a handle on it. Well, until you're born again, you can't get a handle on it. I sat across, sat in my, my office one day with a young man, and this young man, I really like this guy. He was a man's man. I mean, he was a hard-working guy. He's an athlete, and, 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 he, and he loves his wife dearly. He loves his little kids dearly. And, and he's there in his work boots and his dirty blue jeans coming right from the construction site. And he says, Pastor, I just got to talk to you. He says, something happened, and I just can't forgive my wife. He said, I love her, but I just can't forgive her. And, and I know if I don't forgive her, I'm going to lose everything, but I can't forgive her. He said, I, I, I've seen my brother. He had a brother that got born again. He said, I've seen my brother be able to forgive people. And I hear about forgiveness. And, and yet my wife, and actually what his wife did was not that big a deal. But anyway, that's another point. And he said, I just can't forgive her. I said, you're right, you can't. Because you need to be born again. Until you're born again, you, you're not going to have the ability to do a lot of things that you see other people doing that are born again. Like loving people who hurt them incredibly, like forgiving those before they even ask for forgiveness. Until you're born again, you don't have that in you. But when you are born again, then you can. If you, if you were to be born again today, you would find you couldn't forgive your wife. And he received Christ that day in my office, and today he's still walking with Jesus. Jesus. Raised his kids, kept his family together, still loving his wife. What happened to that young man? He saw forgiveness in other born-again people that he didn't have, and he didn't understand it, but he knew he needed it, and he wanted it. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, until you are born again, you will never perceive this kingdom life. You'll not have a perception of it, Nicodemus. And so maybe you're listening to this message and you've, you've met born-again people, maybe a spouse or a friend or a, a loved one got born again and you, you sense something so different about them and yet it's strange, it's different, you'll never understand it. But if you want it, you must be born again. You must. No other way, you must. So well, I'm going to turn over a new leaf. No, the, the other side's just as rotten as this side. Turning over the leaf doesn't change anything. It's still the same leaf. You need to be born again. Well, I'm going to try harder. Go ahead. You'll be like that Chinese little thing you stick on your fingers. The harder you pull, the tighter it gets. You must be born again. You must. So what does that mean? Where, where does that leave us? Well, two things. If we've been born again, let's just praise him. Oh, when the wind blew into your life. That mystery of mysteries, you can't, you, you, I mean, yeah, you can tell the circumstances, you can tell what was going on, but that actual event of being born again, who can really understand it? But we know it. Because his wind blew into our hearts. We were born again. For me, it was 40 years ago. I opened my heart to Jesus. It's never been the same. Never, never, never been the same still real today and some of you can top my 40 years by several years of when you receive Jesus and it why because you receive life that's eternal it doesn't wear down it doesn't wear out it's from the beginning it's from even before the beginning it's eternal life you've been born of that spirit eternal life I think of my father-in-law this morning Rain, Rain found an old picture of my, my father-in-law who's been in heaven now for many years and, and my kids were really little and, and Andrew's laughing because at the moment right as the, as the picture was snapped he had snuck his arm around and scratched his head and, and Matthew's got his baseball shirt in, on daydreaming about something and Rebecca's being a little muffin girl and, and it was grandma's birthday and it was just really a precious picture but I, I thought back to Dad Hills, a rough, tough guy raised in the inner city, New York and and, and, and drinking his life away, just an alcoholic destroying his life with a bottle. But there was, a, there was another construction guy. He owned his own business. His, 
His name was Herc, but they all called him Einy because he was a German guy. And, and this guy was a big drinker too until he met Jesus. And when he met Jesus, he started telling everybody about Jesus. And in his old van, you remember the vans with the fake wood on the side? He had one of those vans, and, and he put up a sign on his van, You must be born again. And every time my father-in-law would see her come, and he'd go the other way. He didn't want to. He'd see her in the same diner. They hung out at the same diner. He'd go the other end of the counter, or he'd leave the, the diner. Because every time Herc saw him, he said, Hey, you don't need to be drinking your life away. You must be born again, Wally. You must be born again. Come to church with me, Wally. You must be born again. And my dad couldn't stand that guy after a while, even though previously they were good friends. Because Einie kept telling him, you must be born again. And then one of his daughters got born again when the neighbor invited her to church. And little little daughter says, Daddy, won't you come to church? Daddy, won't you come to church? Between his little daughter and Herc, Einie, he one day received, he one day gave in to the invitation and he bowed his head and, and he was, said a simple prayer. The kingdom of God came into his heart. The spirit of Almighty God came into his life. And the man that just a few days before was so drunk he had to break into his own house. His wife locked him out, said, I've had enough, I'm divorcing him. So he climbs in through the, uh, the, the kitchen window and slides across the sink, hits his head on the cupboard and passes out on the floor. He's so drunk. But this night he comes in through the door and into that same kitchen and opens every cupboard and takes every bottle of booze and every bottle of hard alcohol and dumps them, dumps them all down the drain, hundreds of dollars worth of booze down the drain, never touched another, job, another drop. He fell in love with Jesus. He was born again. He was born again. Oh, the, the mystery of it. We don't understand it. It's a mystery. Remember what John said, as many as received him, gave he the right to be the children of God. Let's close by saying, how can we be born again? Again, it's, it's like the wind. There's mystery to it. I, I'm not going to package it in a little box and hand it to you and say, do one, two, three, you'll be there. No, I, I believe it's you and God and opening your heart to God. But there are some common elements. Number one is you've got to believe. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him the one that believes is not, not under condemnation anymore. The one that believes is not under wrath anymore. You've got to believe. It's got to be more than just an intellectual understanding. You've got to have that Bible belief. You've got to believe. You say, well, how do I know if I believe? Well, there's another word that comes to play here. We saw it in John chapter 1. As many as received. See, if you truly believe, then you will have received. It's not just, well, yeah, I have this intellectual, I was raised this way, it's been always in my mind that Jesus is the Son of God. No, you've got to believe in the sense that some, something on the inside becomes real. And, and you, you receive Jesus. And Again, I, I, I think any time we take the mystery out of it, we're, we're somehow diluting it, but somehow you just open your heart and you say, God, I, like Thomas, I believe you're my Lord, you're my God. I believe. And so, Jesus, I receive as many as received him, gave he the right, gave that person the right to become his child. So, so have you received Jesus in a personal way? Have you received him? Uh, and I know it's in a different context entirely, but Revelation 3.20, Jesus is, is talking to a backslidden church, but he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. And I believe in some, some way that's like a picture of what it means to be born again. You, you hear the voice of God knocking on your heart saying, open up, open up. And you believe and you open your heart. And, and this miracle, this wind of the Spirit blows into your life and you're born again. And, 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 and through all this, this, this common element, you've got to believe, you've got you to receive. And, and yet through it all, Jesus has to be Lord. When someone's born again, it's because they proclaim Jesus as Lord. Not just as a title, but He is Lord of their life. He's a sovereign God that's come into their heart and, and radically renovated everything. He's Lord. And that's why the Bible says in Romans 10, the word is near you even in your mouth, this word of faith. That if you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, and if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, you're saved. And it's not just repeating a phrase. It's something that happens in the heart, comes out the mouth. 
Are you born again? Have you been born again? Do you know that life from above, that kingdom life? Would you stand with me and, and Connie and worship team? We're going we're gonna to close with song and prayer. And, and, and as we're closing, I want to give you a, just a few moments opportunity to right where you're standing in this room or right where you're listening or watching, if you would just take this moment and, and answer that question, have you been born again? Jesus said you must be. You must, must, must be born again. And you say, oh, it's frustrating to stand in line at the DMV or somewhere and then get to the counter and find out there's something you must have had, but you didn't. Well, what will it be like when you stand before God and there's something that you must have done, but you didn't? There's something that must have happened in your life, but it didn't. Don't take that chance. Don't wind up in that situation. Right now, today, open your heart and say, Jesus, I need you. Open your heart. Say, Jesus, come in. Open your heart. And say, I believe. Jesus be Lord. I believe and you are Lord. Let that miracle happen. It will. It will happen. And you'll become a new person. Born again. And so if you've been born again as Connie's leading us in song. Where you just worship him and thank you for the day that wind of his spirit blew into your heart. Love him and thank him that. Something that for all eternity we will not understand fully, but all oh, the glory of it. Oh, the glory of it. Born again. And maybe as we're singing this song, maybe there's some of you here, all of us here should think of someone that just doesn't get it yet. They're perishing, their life's in the process of destruction, they're perishing. They must be born again. And, and it's, it's, it's a work of the Spirit. It's the wind of the Spirit that will do it. So will you pray for them today? Will you yield yourself to be an instrument in God's hand to, to be like, like those people we shared in my father-in-law's life, the, the neighbor that invited the little girl to church, the co-worker, the construction guy that would tell people about Jesus? Oh, I'm not saying you got to paint the side of your van. I'm not saying you got to wear a banner over your vehicle. But somehow we've got to find the right way to tell people you must be born again. And then trust that this wind of the Spirit will do that miracle in their life. So while we're singing this last song, if there's somebody in particular that's on your mind right now, we just come and kneel down and pray for them and say, God, I, they must be born again. I, I can't just shove this under the rug. I can't just put it in the back of my mind like it's not crucial. They must be born again. Just kneel and pray for them and say, God, save them. Let the wind of your spirit blow in their life. Save them. So we're going to close with song and close with prayer. If you've been born again, worship him. Love him. Thank him. If you're not born again, open your heart right this moment. If you know somebody you want to pray for, just come and just, just say, Lord, please. In the very, very, very near future, open their heart. They must be born again. I pray for them. You, you respond as it's on your heart to respond, and then Pastor Lloyd will close us in prayer. Let's worship him who's given us new life. You must be born again.